Are we ready to feel the heat? We're ready to feel the heat of SummerSlam with yes. Tony Schiavone's only SummerSlam. <laughs> this is such a weird show. Are we doing a sort of general introduction like Welcome to the Conquistadors type deal? You, you, you can do that bit and then handle okay. it. That's fine, yeah. All okay. Right, okay. So Let's who's doing that? Me or, me or you? And... Whichever uh, one. You can do it, Cam, if you want. All right, okay, I'll do it. I'll cut this iron. All right. All right. So, three, two... Welcome to the Conquistadors. This week, the Conquistadors feel the heat for SummerSlam 1989. Stepping into the steel cage tonight, Double A, Ewan Taylor... The Mouth of the South, Cameron Phillips. And Hot Sauce, Jordi Allen Milburn. Only tonight on The Conquistable. Ladies and gentlemen and wrestling fans everywhere, welcome to episode 51 of The Conquistables. Yay, we made Yay. it past 50, look made at us. It, made it past a half ton. Um, yes. It's um, it, it's an episode this evening, I'm joined by um, Ewan and Alan. Hello. Uh, my, hello, my name's Cameron, and um, we're sadly no Phil this evening, he has uh, family matters to tend to, so yes. uh, he's letting us loose on the old mics tonight. Uh, I've just worked out how to invite the recording thing onto Discord, and I think it's working, so that's okay. So if you can hear this episode, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I think it's 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 a little bit of code we have to type in, and I think I got it. It's fine. Um, so yeah, um, I think uh, tonight Al is going to take the lead on uh, this show. It was my pick. We're doing SummerSlam 1989. Yes. I picked it because it was the most logical one to do after we've watched No Holds Barred last month. That's yeah. pretty much the only reason. That's the base reason. That's it. Really, I remember that episode was like wild i sort of flicked through the the final edit and just reliving moments of that film were just madness if you've not listened to it yet why have you not done that but you really should because it is probably one of the most entertaining episodes i think we've done just because a lot for a lot of us it was our sort of genuine first reaction or first reaction in a long time oh yeah yeah i hadn't seen I no, couldn't remember. I've, I've watched it in the last few years, maybe last three or four years, and I, there's bits I couldn't remember. I've only ever seen it the once. I will never ever forget Hulk Hogan teleporting through the roof of a car. Yeah, like landing like Batman, and then you know, <laughs> I think I, I I like to usually have a little kind of flick through the 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 final edit as well when it goes up, and because uh, Phil does a fantastic job doing it, to be yes. fair. And um, then I managed to somehow land. On the very moment you get the the dookie line, <laughs> just randomly, just flicking through and a dookie, which was bloody good. Yes, it was a fantastic time. But as Kara said at the top, um, we're aboard the Geordie bus, so I suppose we should let Al take the floor and get us underway. Well, I will do my introduction to the best I can. The date is August 28th, 1989. We are at the Meadowlands Arena with an approximate attendance of 20,000. We are in East Rutherford, New Jersey, which apparently is pretty much New York. Pretty much. (laughs) So we begin with a dark match, which I always like to uh, include in my little things, in which Dino Bravo defeated Coco Beware. We will never get to see that classic. I'm very sad. I was going to say it's know. not on the network version, sadly. <laughs> I, I, I would have no. bumped this pay-per-view up a lot of points had I been able to see Dino Bravo versus Coco Beware. I, I, I thought so as well. I, I don't so. know if late 80s Coco Beware is going to be anything worth watching, just saying. Well, I'm just going to sort of start before we get into it about the actual concept of SummerSlam. I thought it's the second annual one, so I thought it would. we, we probably will get the first one done eventually, but I thought... We would just do this for the time being. I think at this moment in time, they were trying to find a bit of a niche for it. Because if you think about it, you had the Royal Rumble, which focused on the Royal Rumble. Survivor Series, which was all the tag matches. 
Mania usually had your biggest main event um, of the year, which was true for, I would say, WrestleManias 1, 3, and 5 up to this point in time. Uh, so SummerSlam, they were trying to find a niche, and it looks like tag team main events was their niche for SummerSlam around this time, because the previous year had the Mega Bucks versus the Mega Powers. Mm-hmm. Then in yep. 90, you didn't get a tag team match, but you did get a double main event which was uh, kind of like a tag team match. And then <laughs> you got, obviously, the um, handicapped match made in hell, didn't you, at SummerSlam 91? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Even going. SummerSlam 92 was really a double main event, wasn't it? Because the IC title match went on last, so that was kind of another niche main event to go on. I think it kind of Na- depended on what market you were watching yeah. SummerSlam 92 as to what the main event was, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Na- even 93 had a quite unique match uh, where nobody we've covered it and it may not be the perfect match but I think the Yokozuna Luga match was a very unique um, even the build I know the ending was a bit unique as well with the balloons and stuff I think with all the handicaps that match had considering the two participants yeah. I think it probably overachieved yeah I agree with that and I think they built it up really well with the battleship and the body slam and everything and then the 94 main event of course we had the fantastic Undertaker versus Undertaker. No, no, um, I refuse to acknowledge that. I then, watched that again the other night randomly. It's awful. <laughs> I think it came up on like WWE's YouTube channel, and I thought, I all right, it's twenty two minutes. Like I'll watch Undertaker versus Undertaker. <laughs> it's the oh, way God. that the entire air of that arena gets sucked out as soon as the bell oh, yeah. rings. It just go. What is this nonsense? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And then in ninety five, we're kind of in the era where we've got a pay-per-view every month, so the uniqueness of SummerSlam doesn't need to be there anymore. It kind of is, to agree, a second WrestleMania, just another pay-per-view with whatever main event they'll push. I mean, 95 saw Diesel versus King Mabel, and then we had Vader versus Michaels the following year, and then it was Bret Hart versus Undertaker the following year. kind of fell a bit more into what you would associate with a mainstream pay-per-view after there, but... I think these early Summer Slams are quite quite unique events to try and make themselves look different from WrestleMania. That you know, that's a few months beforehand. Yeah, I mean, this is back in the year when WWF at the time were trying their hardest to establish a brand, and obviously this show had the tagline "Feel the Heat," which the opening video, which we'll get to, they, they did try and impart that. However, I think as far as that goes, they maybe missed the mark a little bit because I was I left that opening video kind of confused what I was watching. Well, this is the part of the Holy Trilogy of Subasavis to a degree because 89, 90 and 91 all had them unique orange covers on the videos, you might remember. Yes, I remember. Mm. Yeah, and these are the three, the three with the unique orange covers, which I think I put on the group chat thing, but... Um, as a kid, I never owned these three. I've I've seen the events, got them at the video shop and stuff, but were for every reason these three summer slams never owned until I was about fifteen or sixteen when I decided, no, why don't I own these summer slams? So went into Virgin, fifteen pounds these video cassettes were. Oh. So one a month, I bought the three of them for uh, one a month to have them all. And of course, this one's called Feel the Heat. Can you guess what the tagline for nineteen ninety is? Ouch! I'm burned. The heat returns. <laughs> <laughs> they were imaginative back then. And I don't think, I think the, uh, I'm just going to Google this, the tagline for um, SummerSlam was just a match made in heaven, match made in hell. Yeah, match made yeah. in heaven, match yeah, made in hell. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't anything about the heat. Nothing about the heat in SummerSlam 91. They ran out of heat puns by then. They only well, had two. you've got Savage and more. Elizabeth getting married, so maybe that covered it. <laughs> I would, I would actually hasten to say that by mid-1990, WWF had ran out of heat altogether, but that's just me. So I I, I personally think, boys, we will have a bit of an enjoyable experience uh, reviewing this. But anyway, if somebody wants to take it with the opening, uh, the opening montage... So we open the show, we cut to our commentary team, which is one Jesse the Body Venture and the debuting Tony Schiavone, who I don't... Uh, seeing Tony Schiavone in the WWF is wrong. I'm very sorry, it's just wrong. Fellow probably butt in at some point and disagree with me, but Tony Schiavone is WCW. He is not it WWF. Is, seeing him there is just odd. 
this entire commentary team, both Ventura and Shivani, are WCW good <laughs> to me. Yeah, in so, a few years' time, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, not long because are they not like we've done like Beach Blast '93 and they're both there for that, aren't they? Yeah. Well, Shivani goes on uh, and Ventura do Royal Rumble '90. That's how. That's the most famous commentary I know the pair of them from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Ventura's last big event is WrestleMania six. Uh, that's mm-hmm. his last commentary. So yeah, I don't know what gap it is. In fact, I'm going to look it up, but I don't know what gap it is between the two of them <laughs> going from um, WWE to. Um, WCW, I imagine it won't be too long, although Ventura well, did have a lot of movies Sh- and stuff. Shivani was only the year's contract from April 1989 to April 1990. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, and it's in um, Butts on Seats, the um, comic book of his wrestling life story, uh, which is great, by the way, if you get a chance to get Butts on Seats, it's fantastic. Um, that he only left the WWF because it meant spending loads of time away from his family. Yeah, and he's I think very his, much a family guy. Yeah, his family lived, I think it was the family were in Atlanta or rear about, so obviously WCW was closer. So yep. that's why he went back to WCW. He still says he regrets it, and it would, you know, if he could have worked something out, then uh-huh. he would have, and his, you know, could have moved his family, then he would have liked to have stayed in the WWF. But when he spoke to Vince about it, um, it was a case of, nah, you're not happening. Uh, uh-huh. Which is why when WCW closed in 2001, uh, Vince apparently didn't get in touch with them at all and um, yeah. then in between um, when WCW shut ch- ch- initially um, Tony Schiavone worked in a branch of Starbucks he did which I wish I was would have been able to go visit that Starbucks how many people do you think would have been like in the drive through kind of going aren't you Tony Sch- <laughs> no no yeah. do you want this do you want this latte or not <laughs> say, say the line talk about Sting and you just get this latte thrown at your head yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, so they do a bit of banter, and then we cut to a very strange promo video. Um, I don't know if they were using leftover footage from one of the WWF the album videos or something, but it just felt like they got random aspects of summer and spliced them together with some wrestling. Is this moves? people eat, eat ice creams and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's da, the da, 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 da. <laughs> the little summer slam theme playing in the there background. You go. Yeah. It's very random. Is this just like an excuse to show some random last in a bikini as well? Well, yeah, of course. It's Vince. No. You kind of think he's, he's probably now blessed in her 60s. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that very probably. True. More than likely. So we go from that to... I, I put in the chat earlier on that I had an AEW comparison here. and I'm gonna. It's actually this opening match of the Brain Busters versus the Heart Foundation. Oh, to me, okay. this is a really hot opening match to put, and that has been AEW's calling card. That the start of Dynamite, you're going to get something red hot, really good to begin with. And I love this match because I love both these teams. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard are just amazing. And I know they obviously weren't in their prime in WWF, but they just work together so well. Well, again, it's like a, you know, I associate Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard with WCW. Sure. In a big way. Um, but yeah, I agree. As soon as I saw this match down on paper, I was like, you've got Bret Hart, Jim Neidhart against Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson. This is going to be incredible. Yeah. And it doesn't disappoint. There seems to be, and I'm sure Al's going to fill us in, shenanigans with the tag team titles leading up to this, though. Well, I think President Jack Tunney um, obviously wasn't doing his job properly because what they say is the Never. match was signed before the Brain Busters beat Demolition for the titles. Yes, However, that's that. it was about a month. It was a month before this show or something. So Tunney had loads of time to try and sign the... Um, Sign the, the match as a title match. Uh, shame on you, Tony. Shame on you. He was too busy seems, counting his toes. It, well, yeah. It seems to be something a bit confusing as to why the commentary team were saying it's a non-title match, but then Bobby Heenan's at ringside say that they've got to retain the titles. Um, I think there was a communication error somewhere. <laughs> so I just like kind of going, all right, okay, we're not quite 100% clear. There's a whole bit in commentary where like Shivani's kind of going, you know, I don't know what the brain's talking about because the titles aren't on the line. <laughs> And then you've got like um, you know Bobby the Brain here and hammering on the ring apron, kind of going, you know, come on, Arn, you know the titles are on the upper grounds. <laughs> you would probably say he was just saying it to motivate them. I think they try and pass it off as that. Why in the world? A question here now. An event, the magnitude of SummerSlam. Why wouldn't the Brain and his men put the titles up against the Heart Foundation? I believe it was because 
they weren't the champions when the match was signed. This match was signed ahead of time before the Brain Busters won the title, so there was no title to put on the line. Is this still the era of the Bobby Heenan family? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, 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 no. they're mentioned. No, the Heenan family doesn't end till 91. Oh, is it as late as that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's, pretty, like, it's pretty much when he goes full-time commentary. Well, yeah. Yeah, understandable. Understandable. But uh, this match rocks all levels of greatness. The, the, there's a one bit of this match also that's like my favourite bit, and it's something you don't see that often in wrestling. And I'm sad that I haven't actually written down who it is. But I think, if I think back, it's Arn is in a headlock by Brett. And he needs to tag Tully. And usually you would get that thing of like, you know, Arn just, you know, stretching across the ring, tried and just can't reach the thing. Arn just literally just powers his way by lifting Brett and then tagging Tully. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 great because you like you say, normally it's the whole he just kind oh, of Arn struggle. Well, Arn just goes, fuck off. And he just gets off him. He just gets off him and he goes yeah. to the corner. It's great. Like, Arn just like Pretty much lifts Bret Hart across the ring and then just goes, nah, I'm tagging you, no stopping me. Yep. So you don't want to move, that's fine, I'll just take you with me. That's the start of the match, the hearts are almost working heels, they're doing all the yeah. heel stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's... really weird. I mean I can't remember what the thing they were like, were they full on baby faces at this point? Or was it did they kind of Oh no, the hearts the hearts the hearts are full on baby face. It's been for a year full at this point, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that makes this whole heelish act really confusing at the start because you, the Brain Busters are quite clearly the heel, the heel team, but you've then got, you know, Brett being pretty dirty. So it's, it's, it's a weird one, but it doesn't affect the match because it, it's still a really well-worked match and the crowd are into it from the start. They all wanted to go out and try and, you know, give a good show. And, and I mean, they were given a big chunk of time. Is it 15 minutes or something? Uh, yeah. Look at the it official time good. up. 16 minutes and 23 seconds. It's a decent so, length of match like it is, totally. It's yeah. obviously the longest... Uh, actually, no, it's not the longest match. Oh, it is, sorry. It is just... Oh. Who would who would have put money on before this podcast uh, that Warrior had the second longest match of the evening? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we'll, 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 one. we'll get to him. Um, yes, but there we'll you get go. To him a bit. The winner of this one is... Um, I did notice in this as well, by the way, that they, even in 1989, there's still a Brett's rope uh, elbow drop. Yes, I did see that. He must have been doing that right from the start of his career. Has to have. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's an early match I watched from 86, maybe, maybe from 85, where he finishes with the uh, with the, the second rope elbow, yeah. Yeah, it's it's brilliant. Uh, no, really nice, powerful match to start things off. Um, so the scientifically finish, sound. If I remember, mm-hmm. I believe we go for this weird... Power slam combo, the Heart Foundation, yes. where he kind of puts Brett backwards on his shoulders to power slam him on top of, um, is it Tully? I think off the top. Yeah, yeah you might yes, exactly. almost a dominator. He does. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, dominator would be the best way to describe it. Yeah, damn. And um, and then the do shenanigans doesn't on hit Brett from behind when the yeah, rest distracted. Um, the rest is tracked by Heenan, and then Arn hits a double axe handle to the back of uh, Brett, and then covered him. And then that's a sneaky pin, which is a bit bizarre because you would have thought with it being a non-title match, it kind of signposts the Heart Foundation winning. But no, it didn't. Um, it was the Brainbusters went over, so it could have been. A, there was no reason why it wasn't the tag team title match. No. Well, that's yeah, it. looking back, no, probably not. But um, it's an unusual one. So um, that was. The opener was good fun. We then cut backstage to Mean Gene interviewing the one and only oh, on, Dusty Rhodes. I, oh. I, I, I need to put my fact in because I've got a fact oh. about every match today. I'm very sorry. I'll go oh, right. Yeah. Um, Here we go. Some rumours, some facts, but I will I will do this one. Um, that was uh, Tully Blanchard's last pay-per-view match. I was in the WWF, obviously. Uh, no, I believe. I, 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 um, I think possibly all round or in big companies because... Um, him and Arn were signed were done in November and mm-hmm. um, and they'd already re-signed for WCW however disputed that Tony um, failed or Tully sorry failed a drugs test apparently 
Yeah, I think he um, did. Yeah, that's what caused it. Whether it's always been disputed whether you know it was a bit set up or not, but that's him to dispute. But he mm. he failed it for cocaine apparently, um, and didn't wrestle at Survivor Series even though he was down on the card. Um, yeah, you're right. And, and as a result, um, WCW tore up his contract and only signed on. That's right, because. I see him um, uh, March 1990. He's in the, A- the, the AWA, poor bastard, um, for two matches. Then he goes to Tri-State Wrestling. And then he appears in WCW in 1994 in a match against Terry Funk at Slamboree 1994. Oh, he actually has a match. Sorry, I didn't I didn't think he had a match uh, since then. So is that his only match? No, he's got actually quite a few. He wrestled at the NWA through 1994. Uh, he was in ECW as well. Oh. Uh, went 43 minutes with the with Shane Douglas for the well, ECW Championship. Pretty much the one WCW match, does he? He's a three, apparently. Oh, okay. um, all against Shane Douglas, oddly enough. Ah. And then there's a random match in New Japan where he took on Tatsumi Fujinami. Oh. <laughs> in 1995, sorry. Okay. And his last listed match is actually an AEW, an episode of Dynamite, where it's FTR uh, versus Jurassic Express. Yeah, I remember there was like a six-man. Yeah, it was, was it not like FTR and Tully versus um, Jurassic Express and Christian? Yep. Yeah. I know it was Jungle Boy, Luchasaurus, and Marco Stunt. Oh, it was when Marco Stunt was kicking around. All right, okay. Yeah. But wow. uh, I think the most prominent match I can find here is back in 2007, where... Tully Blanchard teamed with Ricky Landell and Nightmare against Glacier, Jake Roberts, and Ricky Morton. Oh my god, that's a dream team. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, th- this is, this is um, off the wagon, Jake remembers, so I can only imagine what this match was like. Oh no, that would have been Christ. <laughs> can, I, can I imagine Jake just sitting there on the apron going, Oh Ricky, what's happened to Robert Gibson? He's he's three foot taller <laughs> and doing karate moves. <laughs> Who's this big guy? <laughs> so essentially, what we're saying, what and amongst all this, is that Tilly Blanchard has made stupid decisions that basically <laughs> meant that no company would ever want to work with him ever again. Not, not on a full time basis, anyway. Yeah, it's, I'm uh, just I'm just going to put this forward. Do you think it runs in the family? Well, I mean. <laughs> Based on uh, uh, evidence, I would say yes. Based on his daughter, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Cough, cough. Yeah. Oh, well, well. If we That's haven't gonna... had en- if we haven't had enough of WCW this pay per view, who's up interview next? It was the, the... one and only American Dream, <laughs> the shit version of Dusty Rhodes. Yes, the polka dot version of Dusty Rhodes. Yes, yes the, the polka dot shitey version. The disco I've, got, Dusty I've Rhodes. got to say, at this point in time, it looked like he filled his audition for the village people. Well, this is what I mean. It's like we've done, like, obviously, we've done like Starcade events and things like that. You oh, know, yeah. where like, Dusty Rhodes is involved in some absolute bloodbaths kind of thing. And then here he is saying he's going to kick Honky Tonk's booty. It's almost like he went to the WWF for a holiday. He's got a police hat on as well. Yeah, I, I was wondering that when where did the police hat and he's got a nightstick as well, is he not? Well, he's feuding with a boss man, but rather than actually have a boss. This is the problem with WE's model, which we'll discuss a bit in other matches. It's yes. almost just to sell the house shows because boss man Rhodes is on house shows. To, to me, it would make perfect sense to put that on this pay per view to have a big pay per view. In this day and age, yeah. you'd have a big pay per view match. No, no, he's boss man. Um, I don't even know if I got a proper TV blow off by the, the they were on teams at Survivor Series. And it was mm-hmm. done by the time Rumble came around, but maybe on the Saturday yeah. night's main event we might have got something, but yeah. Wow. So we cut from that to our next um, event, I think I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> event. Dusty- our next event. <laughs> I did not like this match. Uh, the next match was Dusty Rhodes against the Honky Tonk Man. Who the year before was just in his reign as the longest intercontinental champion. Of course. How the mighty have fallen. Yes, very much so. It's um I don't think Honky was ever that good. I think mm. he was in the right place at the right time when yeah, he did I think so as well. Well the rumor so is well. um this this is a bonus um added fact. Uh, yeah. the rumor is it was actually Butch Reed who was supposed to get the IC title that night. 
But oh. um, his plane was delayed, or his car was delayed, or some some he couldn't get to the arena. So they they decided to go fuck it. We'll we'll put it on him instead. There you go. Birch wow. Reed having a long tailway would have been fun to watch. Might be one of them urban myths, but that's the story I've heard. No, oh, okay. All right. Very odd. I don't have much to say about this match. It went about nine minutes. It felt like a million years because I don't need to see Honky on offense because it's just rest holds. Well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, once you got over the comedy bit of uh, Dusty messing up his hair, <laughs> and then, that, I'll be well, yeah, no, it's a functional match. It's okay. And then you get the obvious sort of ref bump at the end when, oh, they're going to go for the guitar. Um, What's going to happen here? <laughs> yeah, look, he's all, oh, look, Honky's holding Dusty Rhodes in a full Nelson whilst Jimmy Hart's got the guitar. Oh, look, he's ducked out the way. And then you pinned him for three, and then you got the comedy oh. moment at the end where he thinks that um, Jimmy Hart's Priscilla Presley. He got the little yeah. bionic elbow in there first before he pinned yes, him. He oh, he did, yeah, yeah, yeah. He finished him with a bionic elbow, and then, yeah, and that's it. It's, and then it's fine. The Although, to be now, fair, we're in the era where the crowd are going fucking nuts for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's what yeah. I like about these old pay-per-views. The crowd isn't there to shit on the product. They're actually there yeah. to enjoy the product. You know? they're, not, like, they're, not, they're not there to get themselves over. They're actually there to like watch the wrestling, which is what drives me insane <laughs> about modern crowds. They're like, oh, let's make it ask myself. Like, No, watch the fucking match in the ring. The people you've paid to watch. Can you imagine watch if someone them. got a beach ball out of this event? Oh, they would have been murdered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, it's just... Yeah, there's there's something to be had for like, you know, oh, yeah, let's look at the hip toss. Whoa! Oh, yeah. I mean, when we did the first um, Starcade flare for the gold, I mean, they were Mm -hmm. going mental for like sunset flips. Yeah, I suppose that's because, you know, you would have seen, you know, that kind of stuff on television every single week. You know what I mean? It would have been, you know, and yeah, I think you're still kind of in the era of kayfabe. Yeah, yeah. so there's going to be a belief that it is kind of real still. Well, I think it maybe depends what state you're in. Yeah, I know, but I think it's going to be like, yeah, I don't think it was acknowledged fully that it's all an act until what about nine, mid nineties? I believe the beginning of the maybe the new generation slash attitude here. I think. Yeah, I think so. Once you definitely once you start getting like you know WCW only insider stuff for their oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. promos and things like that. So well, but, I will give my fact for this match. Oh, Al's go fact ahead. for the match. Al this has one. a fact for the match. I think a bit more well known, but I'll still say it. I mean. Obviously, people um, always say that Dusty Rhodes came in and Vince decided to punish the guy. I mean, if you think about it already, he named uh, Virgil Virgil because of Dusty Rhodes, didn't he? I thought that. Yes. Do, you think they ever, do you think he acknowledged that? Because obviously Virgil and Dusty Rhodes will be in the same building tonight. Well, they're in the same match at Royal Rumble 91, yeah. But you're right, tonight they're in the same building, but there yeah. times they're in the same match. Um, uh, but I just think it's the big, the funniest thing ever is when they got the revenge, isn't it? When Virgil signed for WCW, that was so funny. It was, yeah, good and they got the Vincent. call on Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that's not the fact. Obviously, people um, say that Vince did the whole poker thing to make Dusty look stupid, blah de blah de blah. However, I don't know how true it is, but I've heard the reverse of that story. That okay. it was actually Dusty Rhodes who chose the poker dots. He figured that the only way for him to survive in WWE was to become WWE. You know what I mean? If he was, yeah. you know, if he couldn't embrace the the cartoonness for it, he would get even buried further. So his idea was to kind of play up the goofiness, play up the stupidity, and blend in to a degree to try and get himself, you know, on the card. I mean, he never really passed the mid card. I mean, WrestleMania six, you've got Savage against Rhodes in a dream match, although the singles mm-hmm. matches at next year SummerSlam, but that's a dream match, and it said it was just a throwaway nothing match from both guys, which was a bit sad, really, wasn't it? A yeah. year before, in yeah. 1988, if they told you you, you could get Savage in there, uh, when Savage was champ, I think Dusty Rhodes was maybe WCW champ or NWA or whatever, if you'd said at SummerSlam 88 you can get these two guys in the ring in two years' time for SummerSlam, people would have th- assumed it was the main event or something, not just a, oh, yeah. a throwaway three-minute match or whatever it was in SummerSlam 90. Yeah, it's um, mm. it's a crazy how, how people can rise and fall so quickly in wrestling. It's it's really funny as well. You brought up that point, Al, about embracing the cartoonish nonsense because I think that's still very true today in modern WWE. Yeah, it probably that, is. You know, Seth Rollins was mid card mania, and then he embraced this new character, which I hate with every single fiber of my being. But 
it's over with the crowd, so more power to him. I still think he's going to be probably a face if he has to like wrestle Logan Paul at WrestleMania. Well, I think yeah, definitely. As much as they really want to put Logan Paul across as a as a face, no, no. he's not. He's a cock. <laughs> he is a large sweaty cock. No one likes him. I just really hope that he gets his like you know he, uh, you know I, I I in a traditional sense Maybe I would not pay money all, like watch his limbs explode like he did at Crown Jewel. <laughs> yeah, but I would I would just like to like you know watch Logan Paul even in a wrestling context get beat up. Yeah, I think so. I liked the bit in the Royal Rumble where he came in and everyone just ganged up on him. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah. That was, I did enjoy that myself, personally. Oh, yeah. Um, almost as much as I enjoyed our next interview segment, which was Demolition and Hacksaw Jim Duggan. It's not King Hacksaw no more! It's King Demolition! I've got a whole new outlook on life! These two men have trained my thought to one thing, destroy, attack, and destroy. So Twin Towers, Andre the Giant, you three big men are going down. I tried to write on the notes um, what exactly was being said during this promo. And I gave gave up. I have absolutely no idea what all this is. just lots of shouting. (laughs) Yes, sorry. Did you, did you not like the fact that Duggan's two by four had a crown? I did yeah. like that. Yeah. Duggan's two by four has got a crown. He's got a hockey mask on, and he says that like some. What is he? he says some of the lines of these two men have trained me in the ways of destruction. <laughs> yes, and it's like wow. Um, okay, <laughs> fair I enough. Mean, I- I, I've watched very early Jim Duggan. He was very good at destruction himself because, my God, his stuff in Memphis and such was brilliant. Yeah, I, I, I'm not seen... For reading the podcast Spirit Animal, I've not seen much early Jim Duggan. I always liked Jim Duggan. In fact, you went to not buy you this figure for, you did. for Christmas with the first paint on, didn't I? Oh, yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> that's tremendous. I get you the best presents. You, um, you really do. <laughs> so... Our next event, I'm calling these events, I refuse to acknowledge them as anything, was basically a squash match for Mr. Perfect against the Red Rooster. Poor Terry Taylor. That's what I've got written down here. I mean, he used to to really go for that chicken thing, doesn't he? Well, again, it's embrace the madness. He's even got it in his music, hasn't he? Anyway, um, it's the way it's obviously like going, oh, walk and, you know, tilt your head, you know, jerk your head around like a chicken. Mm-hmm. And you know you, you you can just imagine Vince just sitting there, you know, laughing his ass off. You know, yeah, just like strut like a chicken. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Jerk your head around. <laughs> you know, apparently he's got a mustache now. I did see the photo, and yeah, if you can look any more sex pest, then uh, yeah, <laughs> please it's do, terrific. Vince. Keep keep having a go at that one. It'll work yeah. out all fine in the end. It's working out well from so far. Yeah. So, well. This match looked like it's, it got off for a good start. Yeah, vaguely. It's okay. okay. Well, what happened was they went for the international and Rooster blew his knee out. Oh. Uh, and he's hobbling around a bit, legitimately hobbling around a bit. And then again, Perfect just finishes him off with the Perfect Plex because the match is done, really. He can't, yeah. he can't, he can't put oh. any weight on that leg. I didn't realize that was a legit injury. So, yeah, in, yeah. in the context of that, Perfect did really well to adapt and kind of go, okay, let's just take this home. Because I think they probably would have wanted a bit longer because both guys oh, are I think quite so. good in the ring. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, no, no, he don't, don't, don't They weren't going to rely on the Ultimate Warrior to bring the work rate. Let's put it that way. Well, the, the, he, he got the second longest match of the night. I mean, it's it's enjoyable enough as a match. Yeah, I, I, I always yeah, like watching that little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. I always like watching Mister Perfect wrestle. I think you know, <laughs> he, I, I, I don't think there's that many bad Kurt Henning matches I've ever seen. No, I don't think so. No, he's uh, one, one of the worst ones. Ironically, is SummerSlam '93, which I think again we covered that that should have been a match for all ages. Um, Perfect against Michaels, and it was it just wasn't very good, was it? <laughs> mm, I think also that he maybe had a few stinkers like later on in his WCW career when it was winding oh, down yeah, that way. He was old and broken at that point, so you know it was going to happen. Aye, but I mean, as I say, mostly um, Mr. Perfect is you know bloody good, and I don't mind watching any matches. 
Nope. Uh, that he's in. Nope. Um, but yeah, this one, it's functional. It's okay. I cannot believe that Terry Taylor got lumbered with this shite. Um, and, you know, Perfect it, Plex done. Is it time to my match fact? Yes. yes. Go right ahead. You might have heard this one again. Maybe an urban myth. But apparently, both these men signed at the first uh, at the same time. Mm-hmm. And on one gimmick was Mr. Perfect. And the other gimmick was the Red Rooster. Can you Jesus. imagine if they decided to do them gimmicks the other way around? Oh, my God. What a monumentous waste that would have been. I bet yeah. Carhey could have made the Red Rooster work. <laughs> I don't think anyone could have made it. You're basically asking a guy, a human being, to pretend to be a chicken. In the alternate universe right now, there's a podcast where we're going... That red rooster was amazing. What a stupid get Mr. Perfect. What a stupid yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, Terry Taylor, Terry Taylor, Mr. Pro, a stupid thing. Yeah, we're like, you know, Intercontinental Champion, the Red Rooster at SummerSlam <laughs> yeah. 91 against Bret Hart. <laughs> oh, apparently, oh. on that side of the thing, which probably helped Perfect get the job, I'm not sure who the, the, the agent was, if it was McMahon or one of his guys, but they were interviewing him for the, for the thing and they went, um, So, Kurt, um, what sport are you good at? And he just turned around and goes, all of them. So, yep. uh, and that's a great that, line. All of them. We've got that famous video of him being perfect at all the sports. <laughs> so, I think for me, that perfect gimmick fit him so good. Oh, much yes. better. Much, much better than a chicken gimmick, I think. Oh, God. I uh, think yeah. that's, that's very fair to say. I um, mean, what, what would have caused a human being to think they were a chicken unless it's a real bad concussion? Or a hypnosis. <laughs> I'm surprised I mean, I've never done that. People were lonely on the road, so maybe they experimented. I mean, what, at what point would Vince have got to, you know, would would one opponent have, like, you know, stuck a load of grain in the aisle and he would have just spent ages there pecking <laughs> away <laughs> and then get, get, getting he counted, gets counted out? He gets counted out. <laughs> How yeah, far yeah, would this have gone? Down the aisle and getting counted out. <laughs> Most people bring like a weapon to the ring now. You just sprinkle some corn, and the red just runs yeah. out and it just starts pecking away. You'd have had another, um, you know, uh, like <laughs> a, a, another wrestler who's like a chef. He's, he's, friend, he's friend of oh. his family. Yeah, <laughs> it's it. like pepper. It's like pepper all over again. I don't know. Let's just uh, yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, yeah, it's like kind of going. Oh, we've missed it. Of course he will. What other wrestler is going to be? The boss man. The boss man's there, right? And he's making the red rooster an omelette, right? Yes. <laughs> and then he's like, you're eating little Timmy. Little Timmy's in that omelette. Oh, my God. He's like, I've made you a chicken korma. It's your mum. <laughs> it's your dad. <laughs> and, then he, and then he gets um, a car and tours away a box of eggs. Just to, just to finish yep. it off. Just clutch. There's Terry Taylor clutching onto this uh, the box alien, of eggs. This box of up. eggs as they all fall on the road and they like, splatter all over the place. <laughs> why, why didn't they do this? <laughs> this again, shit makes itself. It's such good shit. There's an alternate universe where this very moment is being reviewed. Yes. So, oh, can you imagine that? That would have been it awesome. Wasn't, it wasn't the big show. It wasn't. It was, it was a <laughs> red nope. Oh no! You know, I watched that clip again recently of uh, Boss Man at uh, uh, Big Show Dad's funeral, where he comes and drags the coffin away. I, I still laugh. It's terrible, but I still I laugh because it's so uh, ridiculous. But, uh, yeah, I've no idea. You thought that was a good idea. It got yeah. brought up with his Hall of Fame speech, didn't it, to Boss Man? Did and the dog on the front of the dog. <laughs> oh yeah, to cook the dog for Pepper. Oh. But, I mean, if, I know we're not. He's not on this card. No, we'll just have a side. Like, you know, good on to Ray Trailer for like putting both sides of the boss man character through like that. Oh yeah, he, he was the the kid's favorite law man citizen kind of guy, and then he was also that as well, the guy that forced people to eat their own dogs. <laughs> he's the most dastardly yeah. piece of shit you can imagine. Both were like you know the best. He went and threatened Big Show's mom to say he wasn't really her kid or something. Says, oh yeah, 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 yeah! He's a bastard. You tell him he's a bastard. Yeah, yep. <laughs> that was some Look ridiculous it. writing back then. Uh, oh, anyway, uh, is it next match? Or have we got an interview in between? Uh, is it interview we have in between because there's actually a famous moment in this interview. Is it the Rick so, Rude one? It is. Hey, <laughs> what's the so, famous moment? I've missed this. this there's, it's not in the network cut, but there is a video out there where we get 
Jay Auckland interviewing Ravishing Rick Root and Bobby Heenan and the, and the SummerSlam sign falls off the wall and uh, Jay Auckland lets out a rather naughty word. Gentlemen, as you know, the ultimate warrior. Fuck it. It's publicly stated that... Damn it, who put that up? Is that $200 an hour? Oh, I thought... When he said this was like... I had a... The mean gene outtake. I was like, yeah. is this the one with the put the, that cigarette out? But I was like, no, that's a rumble. That's very rumble. Yeah. yeah. yeah rumble. Now, however, the it wasn't live. It was a recorded no, was interview. Pre-tape. But some idiot went and played the wrong take. Yeah. <laughs> and played the swearing take. Obviously, now it's edited. Every version of it, the video, DVD, whatever, it's yeah. all edited to be the um, the proper interview. But yeah, they were never supposed to show that. And some idiot. Put the yeah. wrong tape in Brilliant. the outtake version. That's up for the cycle said, forget these lines and telling Jim Ross, can we do it again? Jim Ross goes for live, buddy. buddy. <laughs> no, you're live, buddy. Yeah, that was the best so one. Good. So Rick Rudd says he's going to retain the title. I think that's really all we need to say about that. Now, the next match, I think, was probably because of the other match was so short, this got so long, because this nearly gets 15 minutes which is quite a long time, in my opinion. But I wouldn't say so, given the competitors. Well, yeah, we we got the the first team of the Rockers and Tito, and then we've got the heel team of the Rougeau brothers and Rick Martel. And, of course, the big story in this match is um, Martel turned on Tito at WrestleMania 5. Yeah, I was going to say, we're not that far removed from the strike force. force There you go. That's (laughs) the one. Um, I, will, I will maintain the Fabulous Rougeos have the, one of the best heel theme songs out there. Is this the Real American Boys? Yep. Yeah, we don't like heavy metal. We don't like rock and roll. All we ever do is listen to Barry Manilow. I mean, it's just fantastic. <laughs> it's, so, it's so cheesy and terrible, but it suits their characters so much with the little American flags. I just, I just love it. Oh man, that would have been amazing. It's great. So yeah, this match went probably five minutes too long, which probably was what was missing from our last match. Um, <laughs> this was oh, this was all right actually in the end. Oh, it was very energetic. Everyone was like, you know, going for it and in, in things. Like a lot of matches this evening, it's functional and it's okay, but it just feels it's difficult to kind of care. But again, yeah. just go back to what I said before. Why on earth, after WrestleMania Five, you set it up? Isn't this just Tito versus Martel in singles? Why on earth is it not that? That's the match it should be. But again, you nope, know, nope. If you see it on SummerSlam, you mightn't go to the house shows. Did so they ever get for the house shows? I was going to say they never did... got a big blow off. Which did they never get a pay per view blow off? No, they were supposed to have it a year later at SummerSlam '90, but Martel was injured, and it's so oh. silly because they always would tease it. Every Royal Rumble these two were in always had a go, and they would refer back to the the being tag team partners. But yeah, they never got the big match which they deserve. Like again, WrestleMania six. The opening match was um, Rick Martel versus Coco, and later on in the card you had Tito versus the Barbarian. Why couldn't you just have had Barbarian squashing Coco and then had these two fighting at WrestleMania 6? But no, didn't even get the WrestleMania 6. It seems such a waste, it really oh, does. No. Yeah. They, they did yeah. have the King of the Ring final um, this year, but it's non-televised, of course. No. Oh, yes, I think, I? oh well. So... Again, you say functional, but it's. Um, I've just got here. Um, what have we got? The result. I, didn't, of... I did not like the finish. Martel pins Janetti after a complete mess, is what I've got written here. He punches that's, that's him. He literally, he literally punches him to finish the match. What a lame ass finish it was. It's, it doesn't, it's, very, it's a very cold finish. It's like one of the things have... that they've obviously been told you're maybe overrunning here, guys. Take it home. And that's the first thing they can think of. Uh, <laughs> right, punch I'll him. punch you. <laughs> I mean, again, the fans seem to be massively into it. Well, I think I think this is coming off the back of obviously Strike Force imploding. So I suppose the fans were like, "Oh, is this perhaps a preview of the singles match that obviously we now know never was?" But at the time, you would think that would be the next logical step to take is get Strike Force in a match against each other to blow off the feud. But yeah, 
I mean, it you've never got happens, very, but at the time of fans don't know. Very, very good uh, kit. All six guys are really good wrestling wise as well. They're, you know, they've got yeah. a lot of uh, uh, credentials against them. And the Rockers and the Rouges had so many house show and televised matches throughout this oh, period yeah. of time as well. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so, but it was okay, but like I said, I just thought 15 minutes was maybe a tad too long for it. Yeah. A little bit, yeah, it does feel like it. But maybe, as we say, that's probably just a fill-in time for the yeah. perfect um, Red Rooster match going a bit short, maybe. So, speaking of long matches, is there an interview or we're on to our next match? We get a little recap of uh, the Warrior versus Rude uh, programme as we're up to at the minute. And then, it's uh, you get, which includes a brilliant line from Lord Alfred Hayes. Oh, I do like Lord Alfred Hayes. Well, yeah, they kind of recap all sort of like, you know, the rumble and the pose down and all this kind of stuff. And then there's a bit where um, it must have been like a episode of Wrestling Challenge or something where uh, Warriors, uh, you know, jumps Rude and then beats him up. And then, you know, Rude tries to like, like completely cheat and like whack him with a chair or something like that. But then Warrior gets back up and you get Lord Alfred Hayes going, where does the Warrior get all this energy from? And you want to kind of go, steroids, Alfred, steroids. <laughs> there are what other white powders are in the back. Um, well, who knows? So we get a video package basically showing this feud, and it goes back to the rumble where we have the famous pose down where Rit attacks Warrior. Oh, you get, another, uh, you get another brilliant uh, moment, I have to sort of say, uh, just before we carry on. Um, you have to believe during this uh, like um, highlights package that Andre the Giant can be stealthy. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's so stupid. The man is enormous. Because there's literally a moment where, like, warriors kind of, like, you know, jo- you know, join with uh, Bobby Heenan, and it's literally like Andrew the Giant kind of like, does a sort of comedy, like, cartoon style tiptoeing motion tied to work behind him. It's just like what? The I would have loved if they'd done the thing with him where I can't remember who it was, like, maybe last year, the year before, where the way they shot it is almost like Jaws coming out of the ocean. If, if, right. if Andre just like appeared from like by the apron, just sort of appeared out and just rose, that would have, <laughs> have been great. That would have um, been great. Yeah. What we then go from that to the Ultimate Warrior rambling incoherently. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just seen that. Amazing- the conditions that I have have already continued to worsen as I have broken loose from all the straight tickets and all the rubber rooms across these weak planets. And you, Andre the Giant, will realize that the power will become the eighth one of the world as we eat you alive. But you, ravishing Rick Rude, as I promised, you will surrender. To the gods above, as I beat you! One, two, three! Let's go back to the arena! Uh, one of many occasions he does that, yes. Yep. Uh, then Rick Root and his hair made his entrance. He does, and I think on the network version, his theme tune is overdubbed. Yes, which is a shame. Because oh, the sound levels like, are all over the place, you know. It's like a weird version of his theme, isn't it? Did, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not quite the proper uh, Rick Rude theme. No, so. and it's just like, and you can't, the, the commentary suddenly gets really, really muffly, and it's like, yeah, it's, this is overdubbed. Yeah. So Rude then cuts a promo calling the fans, quote, fat, out of shape, SummerSlam sweat hogs. That made me laugh. Yes. And uh, he asked them to be quiet so he could show the ladies what a real sexy man looks like. And uh, we then get the striptease to reveal the ultimate warrior on his tights because he did oh, like to Rick put his Rude. opponents on his tights. Tights are legendary, yeah. A tradition which was carried on in the modern day by a wrestler who we can't name anymore. <laughs> redacted number one. Yes. Not the biggest redacted name in modern wrestling, but certainly kind of a player now. (laughs) Definitely one of them. Um, The Ultimate Warrior made his appearance to massive ovation. Little did the fans know that was going to be the best part of the match. And uh, we go... I'm going to argue with that. Yeah, I I might as well. (laughs) All right, fair enough. So it's the Intercontinental Championship, Rick Rudd defending against the Ultimate Warrior. I really enjoyed this. I I'll thought it, it was right a now. pretty a pretty good effort for both guys. If you listen to the self destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, it was all Rick Rude. He literally wrestled himself. But I think that's bollocks. Warrior definitely put some stuff into this match. I mean, yes, I agree. I mean, I think 
Warrior was carried by about 99% of the people that he wrestled, but he obviously he had to put something into it himself, otherwise it just wouldn't work. But is this a case of the Warrior had a really great night, or is Rick Rude just that good? Uh, I, think, I, think it, I think it's a mixture of both. I, yeah, I, I'd say yeah. so. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's an important match. Um, Warrior does put a lot into it. Um, but yeah, Rick Rude being as good as he was is definitely helping. But that, um, I think as, as it gets established a lot, War is not the lug, um, the history that we would like you to believe. He's not a totally talentless uh, wrestler. He, he, no. he's, you know, he plays the character well. He's had some decent matches. And yeah, I, I think he's a bit unfairly um, criticised quite often. I think he's mainly criticised because he wasn't a fan. And it's not yes. like he, was, yeah. he wasn't going to do it for the good of the business. And, you know, he didn't well, understand it. But Mr. Lesnar, I'm also looking at you. If that's the case, exactly. And it's like <laughs> very I'm, fair, very fair. One of the main things, as we go past the 50 episode mark, I think one of the things I've learned a lot, you know, one of the biggest things I've learned doing Conquistadors over the last few years is probably how surprised I am at some of Warriors' pay per view outings. Because I remember mm-hmm. being, I, I, I am, I still think I haven't watched it now, and I hadn't watched it at the time. That Warrior versus Savage at WrestleMania Seven is the best match on that card. Oh, it's fantastic! It's and it's brilliant. And you know he's half of that. And okay, you can say, oh, he's in the ring with Savage, and Savage is just you know he's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I think if you maybe put the Warrior in there with someone who was utterly clueless, you're not going to rely on him to you know carry a rookie through a match himself and do no, you know, no, do no, the no. ring general no. thing. But in situations like this, where he can be in there with someone who maybe has a little bit more technical know-how and who can guide him through it. He comes out with some really good stuff. But if you look at it, he had three pay-per-view matches for Rude, all mm-hmm. of which two were, two were good at the cage match. It's not bad at SummerSlam 90. Maybe not as good as the other two. He then had the epic with Hogan. He had the epic with Savage. He had another epic with Savage at SummerSlam 92. So mm-hmm. you, you dish the guy for all these bad matches. He really, on, certainly on the big stage, didn't have that many bad matches on the big stage, you know? Yeah, I mean, we can... Kind of ignore the whole when he came back in '96 and how that turned out. Um, yeah, the Jerry Lawler and Goldust matches. Yeah, there's not that. Yeah. that one. Well, he most, wasn't booked. He wasn't booked right. No, well, most of the um, Goldust match and you know that in your house is him smoking. Yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> it's, more, it's not so much of a wrestling match, more of an art installation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's just um, yeah, but I say pleasantly surprised by the Ultimate Warriors contributions in this era. And that's shown by the fact that they put the strap on him. Yeah. Again. Oh, sorry. You mean the big one, or you mean this one? No, I mean the intercut. I mean the, for this uh, match against the IC title. Right. Obviously, later on he will get the big one. But the crowd are absolutely on fire during this match. They are so behind the warrior, and when he does eventually get the win, they go absolutely ballistic, and it's really good to see. Well, he doesn't technically get it cleanly, does he? he needs a little bit of help. Oh no, he does thing. not. Nope. There are, once again, shenanigans. Is this the shenanigan that I've got written down here? Well, it's a return and Piper who... Oh, had his re- yes! He had his retirement match in 1987. Um, yep. However, he came back at WrestleMania 5 for another stint, and that's his first major feud with a Rick Rude, and he decides to show me his guilt. Well, I was going to say, this might be the first time I've ever seen a match end with the losing team getting flashed to... Uh, to basically job to somebody's ass. I think that's probably the first time I've seen it. I think it's the first time that the ass has been male. That's a good point, actually, yes. Yeah, I think it's so happened on many yeah. occasions where it has been a lady, maybe. Well, you something. remember Sonny did it, didn't it? Uh, Finney's yeah. daughter in the Sonny Finney, and Elizabeth did a similar thing I mean, at SummerSlam. Who's the one in New Japan that seems to wear thongs all the time? Uh, oh, God, that might be uh, Toguchi, potentially. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, he's she, yeah. Less said about that, the better. Um, so yeah, I think on the whole, this was a really, really fun match. I think both guys worked really, really hard, and I think the right result was made. And I think probably up to this point, taking out the the opening match, this was probably one of the better matches so far. Well, so you got the time limit, and you did have a bit of a moment where Rude was trying for. A- 
power bomb struck pile driver that didn't quite go anywhere. Yeah, that, that would that would have killed one if you took that. Quite I think. Dangerous, yeah. Um but no, I thought the finish was was the, the usual warrior press slam and then um, oh, yeah. press slam and big splash combo. But I think it was a good kind of a, a good decision, I think. Even though Rude was a good IC champ, even though a very short uh, period of time, it was um sort of good to put the belt on him back on Warrior and get him boosted for these he's very big year in nineteen ninety, wasn't it? Yep. Absolutely. Do you think they had it in do you think they had it in mind that he was gonna go to WrestleMania for the world title at this early well, stage? Well I don't I... think so and we'll get into that later. Alright. All right. Um... But um you'd also had the fact that it kept Rude strong because he kind of didn't lose properly. Yeah, and so he is not a clean finish. He's the number one contender for SummerSlam next year when Warrior is the champion. It's so an example of long term storytelling. So, yeah, that's what we got to look forward to when we do SummerSlam 90. There we you go. Know. Um, do you have a fact for this one, Al? Um, yes, I do, actually. Again, might just be rumor, but apparently, can you guess how they originally wanted to book this match? Um, um, was it a uh, Pat Sharp on a pole match? Nope. <laughs> it was to replicate the Honky Tonk Man from last year for Warrior just to come oh, no. out and no, squash no, 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 no. him in 30 seconds. No. Nah. <laughs> Not a word. You think they made the right decision going 16 minutes? I would, I would yeah. say so, yes. I would say I think so, so very much. Um, so we get an interview with uh, Piper, Mean Gene interviews him, and basically Piper's thrilled to be back, and he's thrilled that he screwed Rude over, and uh, he was proud of himself. Yes, that's what the face does. Well, yes, exactly. Um, who was next? There was another interview, I think. I've only got the matches, I haven't got the interviews down here. Well, this, this interview, you got Mr. Perfect first, who says the Red Rooster yeah. was, a, was a stepping stone. <laughs> Jesus. And then you get Piper, who says he's going to drive Voyager 3. And then you get, for about, <laughs> for about 10 seconds, Ronnie Garvin. Oh, that's right. Yes. Right. Which is a bit like, what? <laughs> Was he actually meant to be there, or did he mess up? What is this? Come on out here. For goodness sakes, rugged Ronnie Garvin, dressed to the nines this evening for SummerSlam. What's the tuxedo all about? Well, I've got a special assignment tonight. Wait a minute, you're not going to be a broadcaster. You're not out looking for my job, are you? No, 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 no. Don't worry, Mean Gene. Well, I'll tell you, what. what is the... Can I take a look in the just inside? Just wait. A you have fun with I'm these guys. Oh, wait a say. second. I don't want to talk to... I don't want you to interview anybody but me right now. I, I'm going to stick up for this bloke because I think I think he does all right. And I'm going to defend him a bit throughout this next segment, yes. Okay. okay. And then you get Bobby Heenan with the fact that Piper has no manager's license. There shouldn't have been at ringside even though Piper's left the room about two minutes before he arrives. Well, so they, they probably would have been able to catch each other down the corridor at some point. And then we we get the other announcement that we're going to be taking a five-minute intermission. And I, and I have written here a five-minute intermission. This would have been a Machine Gun Kelly performance these days. <laughs> I much prefer what, what we got. Gonna do? You're going you're gonna to lob to the toilets and the hot dog stand in five minutes. <laughs> Riot five minutes oh my god so we then got Mean Gene basically talking about Hulk Hogan's rivalry with Zeus yeah the video packages include Vince saying look at that size of that monster about three times <laughs> yes you know you just get rid of it. look at the size of that monster if, if nobody knew Vince was a body guy after this video package I think it would be very clear god yes yeah. Jesus Christ I was going to say, I'll give one of my facts of this match away now. It was on Bruce right. Pritchard's podcast, this one. So okay. they're doing, I think it's a house show. I don't think it's, if it was a television tape, and I don't think it, this bit aired, but he was brother love and he wanted to get Zeus over with the crowd. So they come to the ring and there he is and there he is telling about how bad Zeus is and how nasty Zeus is and how he's, you know, he's going to destroy Hulk Hogan, blah, 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 blah. And Zeus is there, and he's just standing in the ring. He's just standing still in the ring. So Pritchard starts again, you know, how, how big and me and nasty, and you know, nothing, nothing. Right, so they get backstage, and he literally went, he's like, what was that about? You know, I, I, was, I was wanting you to, like, you know, beat your chest, snarl, maybe say something, that sort of thing. 
And bear in mind, it was just Zeus and uh, Brother Love in the ring. Zeus turns around and goes, oh, I didn't know you were talking to me. Oh, it's very, I think it's very, it's very on brand, I think. <laughs> oh, dear. And, uh, Pritchard's like, well, I don't know who the fuck he thought I was talking about. <laughs> it was only me and him in the ring. <laughs> so, yeah, it's on one of his podcasts. It's, oh. it's about that. I might have not done the story total justice, but it's, it's around that sort of thing, yeah. God bless Zeus. <laughs> So we come back from intermission, everyone's fed and watered and very happy, and we get to this evening's Meaty Men Slapping Meat Match. In oh, the yes. form of Andre the Giant and the Twin Towers of the Big Boss Man and Akeem Vert and with Slick versus Demolition, Axe and Smash, and Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Andre and the Twin Towers are introduced at a combined weight of 1,334 pounds. That is quite a chunky team. That is a very chunky team. Did anyone notice, by the way, the cut to the crowd for just before this match begins for what I will propose is the best fan-made sign of the night? I had missed this. What was it? Ah, uh, they weren't to know, uh, but in retrospect, kind of funny. Uh, you get demolition will topple the twin towers, which is why. Oh. Which is why <laughs> demolition were doing a promo before this from the caves in. <laughs> Oh my god, Cameron. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh, you know, that's, that's, when you, that's when you get, you know, and now, you know, here's Axe, uh, you know, and I'm going to hand over a smash. <laughs> yes, Axe, death to the West. And then... <laughs> Here comes the Axe. Here comes Flight, whatever it was. <laughs> oh, I didn't go that far. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah. Um, this is this is six large men wailing on each other, and I actually really enjoyed this match. You see, there's two trains of thought. There's some people who don't like it, and there's some people who just know that is pure WWF style. That is what it's about: big men just not really wrestling, just having a brawl. And, and I agree. Yep. I I liked all six men in this match, although Andre yep. was pretty useless. I don't like saying it. He was pretty dumb by this point, but it was still a very yeah. entertaining match. I thought. So it actually showed a different side to Hacksaw because you didn't get a lot of, at least in this era of Hacksaw, a lot of the, the vicious slugger, I don't think. A lot of Hacksaw's matches were very light and very sort of fancy free. Well, this one, I think he's realised that I'm in against six massive dudes. I'm going to have to show something. Yeah, well, there's only this. The, the, am I right in thinking there's kind of minimal USAing going on in this match from Hacksaw? This is probably he, the least USA heavy Hacksaw match I have seen. He, he does it at the start, and then that's about well, it. If I remember right. Really. The reason being because like Axe and Smash are from parts unknown, so you don't get any of them chance. And the team, mm. of course, is from Africa. Of course, and, yeah. uh, and Andre Giant's from France. So and the big boss man's from a prison. So yeah, maybe <laughs> <laughs> from a prison. There you go. <laughs> Um, and I, I don't want like to fact... chant for him because he's a murderer and steals people's fathers. So he does, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> They've all seen yeah. ten years see, in the future, yeah. When you say it out loud, it sounds even worse <laughs> that this actually made it on TV. Yeah. Um. What else we got? Yeah, Ho- uh, Duggins and Phil got the USA flag in his face because why not? I think it's a bit neat. Kind of it's thing. Like, uh, it's like his demolition tribute, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's really neat. It ties him in with the team, and it's like still his character. I think it's quite a neat thing, to be honest. Yeah. Although obviously Ventura, for the purposes of heel commentary, has to kind of say it's disrespectful to old glory. Put him on that ugly mug. <laughs> Said later by the man who now lives in Mexico. Well, you know, didn't know that at the time. <laughs> That's true. That is true. So this this was really, I think this match was about seven minutes, and there wasn't really much to it. It was just basically a case of which team would stay standing the longest. And as it turned out, it was team, um, I don't know, demolition hole, hole demolition. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, we'll call them Dougalition. That's great, actually. Like Dougalition. Oh, team Dougalition. Dougalition. <laughs> Yeah. The Dougalator sounds like a finisher. I don't know why. Oh no, the Dougalator sounds like something you buy off specialist websites. <laughs> I call my, call my girlfriend for us. Dougalator. the Dougalator. <laughs> Get the Dougalator hand. We're going to have a fun evening tonight. It just goes, ho. <laughs> Which is, ho. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
But it, it's made of wood, so she might get some splinters. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. It's got, it's got a little crown on top. <laughs> oh, my God. Right, okay, enough. <laughs> right, so the finish saw, I think, Akeem hit a splash, going for the pin, but Duncan got his big illegal board out and smashed him over the head with it, didn't he? Yeah, he like, blatantly cheats to win it. <laughs> <laughs> And the faces go over. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Would you like my fact? Go on, man. Yep. Let's have a fact. Yeah, yeah I like this one. Right, originally. Why, why are you whispering? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's for the best. I, guess the I thought I was, just... getting, I was getting closer to my, my, my speakers there. I was like, hello. <laughs> uh, in case, I don't know. What, uh, right, anyway, back to, back to the fact. So, don't know if you remember, but Big John stood won the Rumble this year. Yes. And then he went on to special referee the Andre Jake match at WrestleMania. And then Andre and Stud got into a little push and match. And this mm-hmm. time, the rematch from WrestleMania won the, with the face and heel dynamic switched, with uh, Stud being the face this time, was going to be the match for SummerSlam. Oh. Huh. However, they realized these two were broken down. <laughs> And it would be very, very hard to function in any sort of match at all. So they put them in a six-man tag match. There we go. No, oh, well, fair enough. However, sadly, Stud was too broken down and would have to leave. And he was oh. replaced by Duggan. Right. There you go. And that's why wow. we got this match. Oh, awesome. That's how this match there was born. <laughs> so... Team Douglasian won, and post-match, Andre and Heenan are complaining to the ref, and the ref just told, tells them to fuck off, basically. Yeah. And, well, Ventura is, really, as, as the heel commentator, saying that the face is cheated, you know, how did that happen? Um, we then cut backstage to the Million Dollar Man with Virgil. Yes, with incredibly racist, white supremacist overtones to this entire promo. When he starts mm. describing Jimmy Snooker as a native animal, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything, but yes, this was a very 1989 promo. It, it, it's definitely acceptable in the 80s. Yes, it's. it's <laughs> mm. <laughs> so we move on from that, and we get Howard Finkel introducing our special guest ring announcer for the second time in this show. Rugged Ronnie Garvin makes an appearance again. Why is Ronnie thing. Garvin a thing? Well, I think we need some context. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get out the context, Clarkson. So it's typical Vince McMahon. Ronnie Garvin very briefly held the NWA title. I think he beat Flair for it. Mm-hmm. Right? But it is a thing of like, oh, I've got to buy anyone up. Dusty Rhodes, Harley Race, literally anyone who's ever had the NWA title. Um, Ronnie Garvin, he'll do. So he came, Garvin, and he was just a mid-carder, but this is his pretty much only big feud. And what he's done is he's had a match with Greg Valentine and lost a career-ending match. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have a job. So what he does is he does other jobs, like referee and ring announcer, but he only seems to get gigs in Greg Valentine's matches. So (laughs) what this is leading (laughs) to is to get reinstated for a big blow-off match at the Rumble. And why I defend this, because I think that blow-off match at the Rumble was extremely well done. I really enjoyed that match, which we might... We've done Rumble Night. I don't think I've done Rumble Night, have we? No, we've not done... We've obviously done Rumble 92. Yeah. Done the first Um, one. We've done the first one. Uh, No, we haven't done that many Rumbles, I don't think. Well, Well, I, I really enjoy Rumble... Uh, Rumble 90 and this match is part of it but that was Garvin's peak because after that he pretty much gets fired down the card so quick I'm pretty sure mm. off the top of my head he doesn't even get the Wrestlemania 6 in fact I don't think he gets on any pay-per-view and he has to serve I think he's there till October 90 but he has to serve to me one of the most humiliating things as a wrestler is when you get put in jobber matches and your tag team partner is another jobber you know what I mean? Like, you're oh. taking on an established tag team, and then it's you and Jobber A against them. Yep. It's usually Jobber A who takes the pinfall, but that's still pretty low down the card yep. when you have to tag team with another Jobber. So basically, you're looking across the ring, and suddenly you realize that you're next to Dwayne Gill. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll leave to make alone. There's, there's a great example of it in I think 92 or 93 where Virgil's in that position where Virgil's with Jobba Egg and he's fighting the head oh. shrinkers and the head shrinkers will fight they legitimately knock Virgil out during the match he's literally <laughs> cut, he's just lying there on the apron and they're like he's just not moving at all and they're just wrestling around him yeah <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's your ultimate humiliation in my thing is when you you damn the card that far and you've got to team up with another job. I'm sure I can think of more wrestlers who have to do it, but um, that's the uh, Garvin gets it in in 1990. He does. There you go. So Garvin does the ring announcing for the this next match, which is Greg the Hammer Valentine against our friend Hercules, who we cannot seem to escape regardless of what show and what year we do. And um, yep. Garvin takes the opportunity to rip on Mr. Valentine, saying he looked overweight by about thirty pounds. But it's not even very good. He's just thinking of stuff. Of stuff. He's there, going to go. He might as well sit there and go. And Greg the Hammer, who smells like cheese. At it's, least it's like playground it, stuff. At least Scott yeah, 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 was yeah, like to the point. He just right? he just called some more Joe fat. Yeah, it, I, uh, I don't know. It just. Well, I'm yeah. going to stick up for Mr. Garvin. Anyway, the match right. was three three minutes and Greg won with his feet on the ropes. But did That's he win? That's all I want to say about it. This match sucked. Did he win? <laughs> well, uh, Garvin then announces Hercules as the winner by yeah. a result of a disqualification just to get Greg all mad. And how does Garvin get his reward? Well, Valentine knocks him out. <laughs> and I also believe it didn't make any difference because Valentine officially won the match. But there you go. Well, yeah, exactly. We'll move on. We then cut to an absolutely insane collection of people backstage. We have Randy Savage, Sensational Sherry, and Zeus. With a cauldron of madness, Ewan. With a cauldron of madness. Sensational Uh, Sherry, what? uh, What in the world is in this cauldron? Oh, mean Gene Okerlin, this is the cauldron of madness that we have spoke of all so fondly in the past month. I don't know what Sherry was smoking beforehand, but uh, it clearly helped. Well, I think she's still smoking it right now. Um, <laughs> because it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of like, kind of going, you know, it's, it's the way Mean Gene says, what, what's this? And he goes, it's a cauldron of madness, through which we can see things. And we see Hulk Hogan losing. Ah, Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan is going to die. And then you can tell that Randy Savage has to go along with this, but he just kind of says, Oh, I see the same things that Sherry sees. Yeah. She, so even fuck he, that. It, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's bad when Macho Man's like, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's just the way he kind of goes, uh, Zeus gets the best part of the deal because he's just to sit and go, in the background. He just sits and grumbles. He just, yeah, he does a bit. He just sits and kind of grumbles at stuff, but it's all good. It's all good. We then get a pro with Ted DiBiase, who was in the ring basically bragging about ending the career of Jake Roberts, which was a bit mean. Ted DiBiase does not get an entrance, which I find no. tragic. He, he doesn't have any music at this moment, sir. So. Does he no. not? No, no money, money yet. So no. when does that appear then? When's the first time he uses his theme song then? It would be sometime between Rumble and WrestleMania 6 because he doesn't have it for the Rumble. Oh. Mm, okay. There you go. Weird. So, so I guess think he does. Hang on, I'm, I'm doubting myself now. I well, might have to go. I, he's number one in the rumble. I don't remember him having the music. All right. I know. Well, I'm pretty sure he does. I've got to myself now. I don't know. We can Google it in a minute. We'll find out in a minute. But um, as as Karen mentioned earlier on, this is the Millie Doll Man, Ted DiBiase, against the Native Savage, Superfly Jimmy Snooker. Oh, yes. Um, this is another match that did not do very well. <laughs> Yeah, with the people involved, it's, I know it's only six minutes and it seems a bit of a filler, which is a shame DiBiase is doing that. But yeah, it's it's botchy. It's not good, is it? Yeah, it's it's very sloppy. It's very just, uh, I think it was mercifully only went six minutes. I think if they had any longer, it would have like stumped the joints up. I think this is definitely a one star special. It's kind of like you guys tried, so I'm going to at least give you some credit, but I'm not going to give you anything that approaches me approving of this match. Um, he, he botches a leapfrog really badly, doesn't yeah, he? Like, how, do you, how do you botch a leapfrog? He gets him in the crush, his face right yeah. in the crush. <laughs> Is that the one where um, Ted DiBiase just like ends up like grabbing him and 
like shotgunning yes. across the top rope. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, it's it's it, it, it's it's not good. So the native savage rolls on once again. It's <laughs> not great. Um, and then I've got down here. It's like uh, Snooker is so wrapped up with attacking Virgil that he gets counted out. Um, yeah, guess, this this I'm, finish is terrible. I'm guessing it's the green that Ted DiBiase put in the aisle. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, That's, coconut. Sorry. Coconut. Oh no! And I've also got. Was Virgil just there to take all the bumps that the crowd would have wanted Ted DiBiase to take? Oh, and, yeah, Probably. I think so. He got DDT Probably. many times, and yeah, yeah, it was always like all the little physical retribution. On Ted DiBiase around, but this yeah. time was done on Virgil because Ted DiBiase had fucked off. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Al, what's your fact for this match? Well, there's not much to say, but I just thought I'd um, I'd go with this fact instead. Jimmy Snooker obviously was in and out the Federation for a long time. This is kind of his comeback year. Um, he was at WrestleMania one as a corner man, you might remember, or some something to that effect. And a lot of people think it was in case Mr. T either physically or mentally couldn't do it. They had a pretty big start to jump in in case he didn't. But I think Mr. T did a good job at WrestleMania. He doesn't get enough credit for that. But that's beside the point. Um, and then Snooker left pretty much after that and wasn't involved. Yeah. And he returned in 89 for this. Now, I don't know if they were hoping he would be better or if he was only returned to, to you know, be kind of a bit of a lower card guy. Uh, and that would do till 92. But he had, which I think I only found out about the last few years, a surprise return in 93. And I don't blame you for not remembering it. But in 1993, I think around September, October, he had two matches on Raw. That was it. He wrestled a jobber match and he was in a battle royal. And I don't know what was happening or where it was going or if they thought it would be a longer deal. But yeah, Jimmy Snooker turned up on Raw in 1993. Wow. Um, yeah, so you can watch watch it on the network. It's on there. He's, I think he's beating. Um, what's Carmella's dad called? It's him. Is it Paul Van Dale or something? He's wrestling name. Something like that. Yeah. Um, that I think that's who it's against. Yeah, and then he's in the battle royal, which I don't think he lasts long. The week after, but I had no idea. And that, you know, for this very bizarre, strange comeback that he would only have two matches, and um, it seemed like it wasn't ever supposed to be a short term deal. So I don't know the reason. Maybe they thought he couldn't cut it. Why they mm-hmm. um, let him go? But yeah, he was only there for two matches. <laughs> there we go. There you go. That's my Superfly fact. There you go. <laughs> there we go. And also, Superfly may have murdered the room, but that we'll just skip over that. Um, yes, yeah, that wasn't going to be one of my. That was going to yeah. be one of my facts. Um, we cut backstage for our final batshit crazy promo of the evening, where Hulk Hogan and Brutus the Bar of Beefcake talk about, among other things, riding around in motorcycles and Beefcake's blades on his hair clippers. Can we point out? The well, another crowd sign, which I think is the second best crowd sign of the night. Go on. It says Hogan and Bertus rule. Oh, Bertus. Bertus. Oh, Bertus says. Yeah. Bertus says like a nineteen nineties BBC One children's television show. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know why you had to get his brother Brutus. Bertus was a much better wrestler. Here comes, here comes, hey kids, here comes Burtis <laughs> to tell you a story. Um, I mean, is it, but, is it? maybe like a relative of Bertha. I'm going back in time with these references now. I was just about to go, Burtis, lovely Burtis. Yes. Everything you make is a dream. <laughs> da, 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 da. Ah, Bertha was a wonderful show. Anyway, <laughs> enough about 1980s BBC children's television shows. Appalling um, health and safety in that factory, though. <laughs> also, can we point out in this promo that Brutus the Barber Beefcake seems to have run out of fake tan for his face? Yes. <laughs> I think it was more that like Hogan was so mahogany that anyone beside him looked pale. No, he's, he's like his chest is like tanned, and then his just his neck goes pale white, and then his face carries on. It's <laughs> just know. like it's just I don't, either he's like run out of fake tan or he's sunbathing with a crash helmet on. Oh wait, when was the, when was his uh, speedboat crash or jet ski crash? Oh, was it? 1990. Oh damn it! Okay, ah, I, maybe... I see you're trying I... to make me feel bad. <laughs> Wrong, <laughs> denied. <laughs> damn it! All right, fine. <laughs> so we cut from this promo to uh, a sad moment where the now departed genius is in the ring reading us a poem. He is uh, the sadly recently departed. Uh, Lanny Poffo 
Yes. He's um, in the ring. Yes. I just think it's amazing they never tied him and Savage together in any capacity in this. Uh, you know, in this, in this room, I, isn't it? I don't know when I discovered that him and Randy Savage are brothers, which seems oh, so obvious. Well lit, well seems lit, so obvious the, uh, when you see them together, when you think of them together. But it then was you're probably like, probably in the internet in the two thousands. You know, probably, so, yeah. yeah. And you're like, wow. Um, but yeah, he's um, they're properly, you know, you know, never referenced as brothers at all, and it's just Not, weird. I mean, we've even we've even had obviously Scotty Too Hotty. Sorry, Brian, the wrong person. The Grandmaster Sexy and Jerry the King Lawler. I think everyone knows that they are father and son. But well, that was always like referenced on commentary because GR well, would say, yeah, it, and it was like yeah, yeah, and, the, uh... and Lawler would deny it, and it would be the running joke was like, yeah, he, he looks just like you, King, and it's like, and I go, no, he doesn't. I don't know what you're trying I, to suggest. I, I, I think GR did that when the King was pissing off, so he just thought, you know what, I'm going to shut him up for five minutes. Let's go with this. Possibly, but it's yeah, it's only like a lot of the pay per view project things I did. It was like, yeah, Jerry Lawler yeah. is once again denying that Brian Christopher is his son. Um, but yeah, um, so we... the, the genius was awesome. Um, was. that's cool. So, yeah, it was. So, Miss Elizabeth is introduced to the ring, who's going to be in the core of Hulk. Well, we get, we get Zeus and Savage arriving first. And then yeah. uh, Sherry and Macho Man both seem to be wrapped up in tinfoil. Um, and then Burtis gets his own intra- entrance. Of course he does. Oh because then Hogan gets to do his own one. Because mm-hmm. uh, there's no way that Hulk Hogan is sharing an entrance with anyone else at this point no. in time. And then obviously they do the whole thing about how, you know, in their corner is going to be Elizabeth. And there's always this kind of like really weird kind of dichotomy that goes on between obviously Sherry is the evil harpy slut and wow. Elizabeth well in comparison and Elizabeth oh, yeah. is, Elizabeth is the sweet you know snow white pure as the driven snow Virginia I bet she was <laughs> a dirty minx in the bedroom I couldn't possibly comment well you can't he's a libel the dead can you so um <laughs> I don't know well uh, you, you'd have to ask Luger wouldn't you Oh, this our main event of SummerSlam 1989 is the Matchman Randy Savage and the statue known as Zeus versus yes, Hulk human Hogan. Human machine. Oh, poor Taz. Um, Hulk Hogan <laughs> and Bertus Beefcake. Bertus Beefcake. I, the more I say that, the more that really should have been his name. But never mind. It makes um, sense though, in a weird kind of way. <laughs> why? Uh, anyway, um, Hogan's a bit over in this match, isn't he? As he was for pretty much most of this period of time. Yep. Um, Zeus did some stuff. I think during this match, the advantage that they have is that they've put Zeus across as this like monosyllabic killing machine uh-huh. that Randy Savage can control. So about <laughs> six or seven points during this match, you literally have Macho Man on camera audibly telling him what to do for the next part <laughs> yes. of the match. It was, it and it doesn't, no <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter because it kind of fits with the character anyway, even in kayfabe, is the fact that yeah. Savage is going to be like, you know, the experience of the team, so therefore he's just going to tell this, like, you know, this killing machine where to go and what to do. I think he's the only one he'll listen to. So it fits yeah. in. It doesn't, it doesn't seem out of place. But yeah, no, it, it match your mind. terrible. Yeah, Macho is blatantly telling Zeus yeah. how you know the next sort of couple of minutes how they're laying it out. Yeah, um, this really I think was just a vehicle to obviously get this Zeus Hogan thing over the line and done. But I will give Hogan credit; he does go through his routine, but the crowd are absolutely eating it up throughout. And I think that this is why I didn't completely hate this match because we had worse matches earlier in the card, and at least this had. The Hogan nostalgia of the usual uh, big boot, leg drop, one, two, three, done. And Zeus, for all, he really didn't do much. I think he played his part considering he really wasn't a wrestler as such. He did what he needed to do reasonably well. It wasn't botchy, it wasn't awful, it was just really a nothing match. But I think this was just really more a vehicle to, one, try to get people to buy, go see the holds barred, and two, I think continue to build up Hulk Hogan's stock as this unstoppable hero to mankind. 
Yeah, I, I thought Zeus did well. Like you said, he, he's not a wrestler. He had very limited time to train to be a wrestler. He's an actor. Yep. Um, and they've put him in this this spot, which I think to time maybe is a bit overwhelming for the guy. But here he is, suddenly having the bloody main event, the pay-per-view out of nothing. And you're right, Savage obviously is a good hand to carry him. But I think he did everything pretty decent in which he had to do. You know, you're right. He wasn't... Yeah, he did basic moves, but that's, you know, so does Andre the Giant, and he's really, you know, he's the, uh, but yeah, he's, you know, I thought Zeus did very well in this match, and I thought as a main event, I thought come across quite well. I think Zeus is simply told during the start of this match to, he's got two moves, he's got Bear Hug, and he's got um, Choke Hold. And yeah. then, you know, it's just stuff that he can hold on to, uh, it's not going to take any great physical exertion on his part, and the other guy can just sell it like death, or, you know, on their yeah. own. I the, other th- the other thing is, I bet I, I don't know this for sure, but I bet Zeus would have something in his contract. You know, if he's if his acting career got ruined by a, a mistake or something, he must oh, have had some yeah. compensation 100%. thing in the contract. Oh yeah. god, uh, yeah, totally. It's the you know. So, yeah. I think it's the reason I, probably why the Rock so so seemingly reluctant to come back to wrestling because yeah. obviously if he gets injured. Well, he's I think this the, the last time he wrestled, he had to like delay Hercules because he like tore like three or four different things. I think he like, like uh, within uh, about the first Cena. two minutes of wrestling scene, he tore a tendon or something like that, didn't he? Something like that, yeah, which delayed Hercules for months. So I think basically he is he has done as far as that goes. But I, I think for a main event, this did it. It served its purpose. It wasn't offensive. It wasn't anything majorly exciting. But I I left the the end of the show feeling pretty okay. Well, I'll just talk about the finish before we get there because there's a little clever bit where they use the loaded purse to finish it. Sherry's loaded Mm. purse to hit Zeus. And I think Hogan seems to sell the weight of this purse quite well. But it's a shame (laughs) Sherry didn't really sell the weight of the purse throughout the whole (laughs) the whole thing. And then um, Hogan, you know, sells it to really you know you know bag over. I don't know if you ever found out. Yeah, if you remember at the end of WrestleMania 9 when they used the IRS's briefcase, you found out it was full of money, gold, and bricks, I think it was. But <laughs> this year, I don't think you found out what was in the purse, although they did run the similar purse spot with Macho Man and Dusty the following SummerSlam. But yeah, you assume it's a brick or something in there, and that's obviously what beat Zeus. He didn't lose cleanly, and then the slam and the leg drop end at the match. Um, yep. Part of it was because they thought that might be their only match, but... They did manage to stretch it out, obviously, for the year. And originally, there was a possibility this was your WrestleMania six men event. Ah, Zeus Hogan. I oh. mean, I'm I'm so glad they went with the Warrior. But yeah, imagine that <laughs> for WrestleMania is, six. To be honest, <laughs> so you'd be relying on the fact that Zeus would have learned how to fully wrestle at least a bit more yeah. in between now and. Toronto. No I chance. just guess he probably had other gigs and he just wasn't yeah. interested. So. And um, they just did it the blow off match. I mean, what was strange about this is Zeus taking the pinfall. It's like surely Savage should have took the pinfall, and then Zeus would have still been there for the the blow off match earlier down the line. So I don't know if this point in time they were really set on that blow off match because it makes perfect sense for Savage to get pinned, doesn't it? I mean, it is know, a pinfall pinned. when he gets a brick to the face. It is, so it's protected him a little. So bit. it's a little bit. But okay. Savage, he, you know, Zeus could have took the brick to the face just to like subdue him whilst the pinfall's going on, and then you know Savage could have took the actual pin. But there you go. But no, I, I, I honestly thought this was a thoroughly enjoy, enjoyable SummerSlam. I, the only thing I spoiled it a little bit is watching it in one go. Is there is four tag team matches on the card? I yes. don't yeah. think you really need four tag team matches on the card. That's what Survivor uh, Series is for. I would have liked to have seen. The Rockers Russo match stripped and just had a Martel Tito as the singles match. Although the match wasn't bad itself, I just think that would have been much more fitting for this pay per view to have the Martel um, Tito as the singles match and knock a tag team match out of it. I'd, I'd like to point, point out to our listeners that Alan is denying Marginetti a pay packet in that statement. <laughs> Well, to be honest, all Martin would do is probably put it up his nose, so maybe it's not a bad thing. Well, you know, <laughs> not denying so, anyone a pay packet, I'm just saying. I mean, you know, we, we already denied poor Dino Bravo and Coco a proper pay packet. I wonder how much they, I wonder if they got paid to put the match not being on pay-per-view. Probably. Oh, at, at least, least to know well, that. <laughs> I imagine they'll get paid so. for the appearance, but they won't get paid this 
sort of substitute for being on the a show. stuff, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I'm trying to think. There must be other wrestlers off the card, and I'm desperately trying to think of some relevant at that moment of time that didn't wrestle. Um, you talk amongst yourself like that. Uh, All right. Bad, bad news, just... Brown. What was Bad News Brown doing? He wasn't on the card. I did, we denied him a pay packet. Uh, he was probably calling Piper a racist. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, he, yes, he's, he's well, sure we played that, but where we've played the blackface tape over and over and over and mm-hmm. over and over again. Well, he's, he's only he's only got about six months before he has to witness that at this point in time. So yes. Well, yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> so um, the show ends with Hogan celebrating the usual kind of stuff, and of we course. get some replays of the key spots in the match and then we get the sign off with the commentators telling us about Survivor Series which is going to be coming up later in the year and that is that yeah pretty much um, decent enough I think is the key phrase for the I, show I, I, I agree I I, um, I remember watching well, it back I, as a kid when I got that video thinking it's much better than I remember and even today um, reviewing everything I'm like yeah you know this, this, this wasn't about SummerSlam I don't think Okay, well, I've got the table up in front of me. So the closest, the closest match, sorry, the closest show that I think around this era would be the Royal Rumble nineteen eighty nine, which is at number twenty four. I don't hmm. remember much about the Royal Rumble eighty nine. Oh, well, what is? You see, the problem is the Royal is really hard because they them sort of shows have got really soft spots for me. But what is number twenty mm. three? Number twenty three is Survivor Series nineteen eighty eight. The first Survivor Series. I don't like to say it, but I don't think it's it's better than either of them. It'll be the second Survivor Series eighty eight, but I don't think it's better than either of them. What is twenty five? Number twenty five is WrestleMania five. <laughs> oh God, we're, we're very eighties and nineties. Okay, one yeah. after it. Uh, one after it is SummerSlam nineteen ninety nine. I think WrestleMania five has got a better main event. Yeah, that's what I mean. Oh dear, and what's um, after the SummerSlam '99 really got that low down? Did we really put it yeah, that low down? We did. What's after? What's after SummerSlam after that '99? Is, uh, Survivor Series '91 and this Tuesday in Texas. The I, would, Lewis, I, would collection. It, I would put it above that, even though I did quite like that as well. I would put it above that one. What's your fair. guys' opinions? I think that's fair. So, what but position I, does it occupy? It would occupy number 27 out of 42. I'm, I'm being very up, up. objective on that one because I would personally put it above SummerSlam 99, mainly yeah. on nostalgia reasons because, you know, I love my old shows. But I think SummerSlam 99 wasn't a bad one either, so I'll give no. the Attitude Era the benefit of the doubt, although I did love right. this show. i got to say I did enjoy SummerSlam 92, 89 even. Yep. So, we, the Conquistadors, have rated SummerSlam 1989 as the 27th best show of all time. And there we go. It is done. It is done. Chisel it on the done. rock. So, the question is, what yep. comes next? Well, that is in my hands, and I have been turning and froing for a couple of days on what I wanted to do. And I've, I've settled on a theme. That theme is going to be, this show is going to emanate from the UK. Okay. And I had a couple of shows in mind I was thinking of. Right, I right. Thought it's, about, uh, it's, on, it's on the network, right? It's on the network. Yep, don't worry. That's it's fine. on the network. Um, so I thought possibly about doing one of the insurrections. Then I thought maybe one night only. But then I remembered a show that I watched for the first time Probably a couple of years ago, and it contains... Is it 1998? No, it's not. Oh. I'm going to take you all the way back to October 3rd, 1991, and the Battle Royal at the Royal Albert Hall. Oh, Oh, now that's... Presented by Sky Sports and the Daily Star. I like that, actually. Yes, you're right. We'll learn a lot about uh, during the show. I um I got this on video. I, I know it was a special on was it Sky One possibly the special Sky Movies Plus it was oh, Sky least. Movies Plus. But um I didn't know that at the time because I uh, didn't have Sky. But um yes I got this on video and I I got it. I don't know maybe other people might know this. I got a faulty copy of the video. It was oh. official. It wasn't a copy. It was official tape, official box. Mm-hmm. And I won't spoil the ending just in case. But the tape very abruptly just ends after the last match and rewinds itself, you know, like it's run out of tape. 
Mm. Uh, but there is nice. definitely just a, not much, but literally like 30 seconds of footage still to come. Because usually at the end, you get the disclaimers and then it goes black for a, a minute or so. Yeah. Nope. Mine just ends after the match, just starts rewinding itself. I'm like, why is the tape so short? Why is it not? <laughs> the tape's trying to kill itself. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was a bit, there's a kid, but obviously uh, it's released on the Tags Classics DVD. And I dare say, is it on the network? It is on the network. Yeah, it's on the network. Uh, yeah. It's no, the, uh, um, pretty decent show uh, from my memory. So, right. yeah, that's where you're this, this also continues the Andre Giants a bit broken trend. Uh, yes, yes, it does. We're going to have to get uh, some contains, However, it does contain the Mountie, so it immediately gets extra points for me because I fucking love the Mountie. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you, Ewan, but I don't think he's got his Mountie theme for that. Oh. I'm sorry, he hasn't not. got it yet. He hasn't got it yet. Fair yeah. enough. I'll just sing it to myself. It'll be fine. Um, no, it's it's a fairly interesting show, I think. Yeah, I think we'll enjoy that one. It's, yeah, a good, it, it's unique settings and everything, yeah. Well, that's why I like. That's why I went for it in the end because it, the Royal Albert Hall is always a very famous arena, and to see wrestling in it, and especially WWF wrestling, would have been absolutely insane at the time. Because you've got yeah, it's a unique setting. Like. And, you get a lot of yeah. Lord Alfred Hayes on it as well. Of course, yes. That was another reason as well because uh, <laughs> Lord Lord Hayes was definitely on the sauce during this show, and I believe. Um, I'll look it up to be sure, but uh, Mr. Regal is in the dark match. He is. Having, having not signed for anyone yet, he's still a <laughs> British wrestler. He's in, he's in the dark match. Because yeah. what, it's 93 he starts in WCW? I think yes. so, yeah. Yeah. Lord Stephen Regal, yeah. So, this, I think this is going to be a fun show. I think we'll, we'll enjoy this watch back. Yeah. And for me, um, it's sort of bringing back, this will be sort of around about the time that I think it was either the show the year after we got Sky and I started being able to watch what would have been God oh, Rest Superstars maybe? The early days of Superstars. Mm-hmm. Um and I remember seeing the uh the tours being announced, obviously the the rampage show. And my, my first wrestling show I remember it vividly was a WWF show at the SECC and I came home with a Tatanka foam Tomahawk. Yeah, the red one. I held on to oh. Yeah. Someone was selling that on this website, my mom, for 70 quid. Oh, yeah, I that was that. So, and I also remember seeing um, Earthquake. Nice. Um, even, from, even from the cheap seats I was in, I could say that Earthquake was a, a large gentleman. Well, yeah, he I, he was definitely quite on the large side. What, what so, year uh, do you think that was, uh, Ewan? Oh, God. Um... Oh no! Well, I'd have to look it up. Let me see very quickly. SCC. Um. Hold on. Oh, hang on. This is. It? I. Is earthquake on that one? No. So it would probably be ninety one, maybe on his own. Uh, that's ninety four. Yeah, the brief singles run in ninety four could have been then. Let me. Let me check. Uh, was it ninety three, boy? It'd be tough to get Earthquake in '93, but it would be at the very start. Maybe it was Earthquake then. Uh, was it '94? Maybe because I had Earthquake against Bam Bam Bigelow. Oh, that sounds like '94 match to me. Yes, I'd be He's, surprised. Oh God, saw, Unless it was Diesel? Typhoon against Bigelow. Um, no, that it was Earthquake that, against Bigelow. I think that would be '94. That's that's what it sounds like to me. Oh my Unless, God! I got to witness Men of the Mission against the Quebecers. Wow! Oh my god! <laughs> Although the main event was Bret Hart against Owen Hart. Yeah, that would have been cool. Yeah, well, Diesel against Tatanka. Oh, oh, I saw that in mine. Um, what, what, what month? Oh no, it was '94. It was fine. I was in March. Um, I also got to see Diesel versus Tatanka at Newcastle uh, Ice Rink. It really yeah. Ice Rink. Yeah. There you go. I also apparently got to witness the Five Star Classic of the One Two Three Kid against Quang. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been all right. Well, it would have been probably better than the IRS against Doink. Yeah, I'll give you that. That would have been better. Yeah. That that's got piss break written all over it. <laughs> you know, you know what, you know what we need to do, you, right? What we need to do um, for one of them round table things is we need to discuss our first house shows each. Oh, that sounds good fun. Uh, uh, you know, I know what mine was. Um, uh, I you might. 
I ain't been to that many. <laughs> well, there you go. Was yours the one with me? Or you, you yeah, one probably. Yeah, my first ever oh, one. There you go. I can, I can, I can, uh, I can give you the list of matches because I know which one it is. And I don't know what Phil did. We could ask Phil what he uh, what what he would. I just think maybe for a round table that would be an interesting discussion. No, that'd be quite funky, yeah. actually. Yeah, a bit of nostalgia there. But yes, so bro, Battle Royal, Royal Albert Hall from '91 will be covered next month. Gonna be good. Gonna be good. And uh, all I'm gonna say is Roddy Paper's gonna fuck you up. Yeah, and Burris. Bart- no, no Burtis in that one. No, well, what, I don't think Burtis is here, unfortunately. What it is, you get everybody on the card in the Battle Royal, with the exception of Roddy Piper and Typhoon. They don't have to wrestle other matches. They just get to go straight in the Battle Royal. Isn't that unfair? Everyone else has to wrestle. Them well, to, a to be fair, they, were, they probably had to sober up Piper enough so he didn't see anything <laughs> controversial. And Typhoon was at the buffet, so they had to go find Maybe. him. Burtis, yeah. Keith Bake. My God. No. Wow. <laughs> oh no. Well, that concludes tonight's show. I have sadly got to get my washing out and do some mining, uh, which I don't want to do, but it's right, must. Well, we'll, we'll and just then, come, we'll just... I know we've got an excitement day tomorrow. We haven't. Oh, you bastard! You have. I have not. <laughs> well, I'm not Shoot. at work anyway, so. See ya, enjoy it. Can we edit, uh, make sure we edit that bit out at the end? Okay? Yes, I think yeah. we better. How do yeah, you get rid of so, the uh, uh, recordings then? How does it just like. Should we not just like do, say goodbye first? You know, I think we should probably just say goodbye. So, oh, from no, myself. Make, oh, God, make sure so from Al, Cameron, a bit and out, myself. Yeah, before <laughs> Al gets the sack, then he just wants. Right, right. Start that again and don't mention anything bad. Right, go. Okay. Um. That's the Conquistadors. I'm Ewan. That was Cameron. That was Al. We'll see you next month at the Royal Albert Hall. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Right. Make sure Phil cuts that last bit out, okay, when he does the <laughs> We'll see. We don't need anything <laughs> spicy. like my fuck.